This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Box Brown. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, one of the two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this interview episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Box Brown. His new book, Tetris, The Games People Play, comes out this week from first second. But before we get into that conversation, I want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off at the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off at the cover price. And every single month, including October, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off at the cover price. Sometimes it's 50% off cover. But often you can find discounts that go higher than that. And since today I'm going to be talking with Box Brown, it's only appropriate to point out that you can find his book from 2014, Andre the Giant, Life and Legend, at 30% off at the cover price. So you'd pay only $12.59 for Andre the Giant. And it's a great book. You should definitely check it out, as well as many of the other specials that you can currently find at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. I had a great time talking with Box about his new book, Tetris, uh, not only because I remember playing Tetris back in the late 80s, uh, but also it's an informative book that tells us something about games in general, but also about popular culture. This is a highly detailed book with Box taking a deep dive into the history surrounding Tetris and the game industry at that time. So now let's take a listen to my conversation with Box Brown. I'm pleased to have on the Comics Alternative, Box Brown. His new book, Tetris, The Games People Play, comes out today, October 11th, from 1st 2nd. Box, welcome to the Comics Alternative. Hey, thanks for having me on. Sure. You know, maybe I should say welcome back to the Comics Alternative, because yeah. <laughs> you've been on not just once, but twice before. I, I went back to look at some of our past episodes. Now, obviously, you talked with us about about a year and a half ago when we did our publisher spotlight on retrofit big planet comics which which was one hell of a fun show mm-hmm. um but i also noticed that in 2012 uh you had a brief interview that we published when one of our co-hosts Andy Wolverton was at Small Press Expo and he he talked with you then and that went up oh, wow. like a couple years ago I wonder – that's funny. I guess – I wonder what we, what I was uh, – I guess that's right in the beginning of Retrofit maybe? Yeah, around that time. And, and yeah. I, would, I guess Andre the Giant would have been out by then, right? No, it did, Andre didn't, didn't actually come out until 2014. It was 2014, the SPX. Oh, OK. Yeah, so yeah. that's probably what it was. OK. Yeah, so welcome back to the Comics Alternative. And, uh, you know, th- this is um, – this is a fascinating book. Uh, I mean, you know, we really enjoyed and discussed Andre the Giant, which in many ways I guess is similar to the new Tetris book, Where, but whereas with Andre you were primarily focused on one individual. I mean, here you're looking at a community of people surrounding the phenomena of Tetris. And so I guess my first question is where did this interest in Tetris come from? So, you know, like uh, when I played Tetris when I was a kid, just as much as everybody else, um, and, you know, it was a big thing around my house. Like, you know, like, um, 
my my uh I would once in a while get my dad maybe to play Nintendo with me or my mom. But um Tetris was a game that I'd have to like wrestle away from them. <laughs> you know? So um but I think that was a similar uh you know experience that a lot of people had uh, at the time. Uh so um that's kind of what makes Tetris one of the things that makes Tetris like really special is that it like crossed uh, demographic barriers that that other games didn't back then. Um, <clears throat> but uh, my you know recent interest uh, came. Uh, I saw a it was kind of a weird uh, uh, weird uh, story because I I was I saw a I, I watch documentaries all the time like while I'm working and I saw a documentary about Tetris like an old BBC documentary. Um, called From Russia with Love. And it, it was about like the business dealings behind Tetris. And uh, it was cool and like super fascinating because the story is so is super fascinating. And, and, and it had interviews with everybody. And, um, and uh, I, you know, I start talking about it, start thinking about it, start when I'm like in random conversations with people being like, hey, did you know that this game Tetris, blah, 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 and like start t- telling them about it. And then um, around the same time, uh, you know, another um, another fellow comic artist, um, Faith Aaron Hicks, Mm -hmm. um, she uh, had I think she saw the same documentary and um, which is weird because it was like 10 years old at least. Uh, and, And she started talking about it with my editor with the same editor and uh, and and. They were both like that would make an awesome comic, and and my editor suggested it to me. But it was like within like a week after I had watched the documentary myself, and I was like, yeah, that would make that. Yeah, I I was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. It was a weird like uh, kismet <laughs> situation, and um and so yeah, then I got into doing all the research. Now, how much did you know about the history of Tetris before you did the research? Uh, I mean, in, any of it? Because there, I mean, there there are a lot of facets uh, and a lot yeah, of people involved so, in this history. Yeah, so I knew what was in the documentary I'd seen, but also when I was a kid, uh, like you know, I was like you know whatever eight or nine years old, and um, I remember there was two versions of Tetris for the Nintendo for the NES. And and one came in like a weird black cartridge that didn't look like any of the other Nintendo games, which came in like a gray cartridge. Then they all looked like all the games look the same except for like Tetris and like two other ones that no one else, no one had the other ones. Though, I don't think. So it was always like this weird thing. Like, why is the Tetris game black? Why is it in this weird cartridge? And I had a cousin who was like really into video games, a little bit older than me. And he was like, that's the illegal version of Tetris. And didn't really elaborate on it further than that. And that was just like the rumor going around that there was this illegal version of Tetris. So, uh, you know, I I think, so the mystery for me goes back that far. Hmm. So when when it came to the the personalities uh, behind this big drama... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of them, and then I haven't seen that documentary that you'd mentioned, um, mm-hmm. but, but were the, these people, or at least many of them, uh, mentioned in the documentary, how many people did you discover on your own doing your research? Mm-hmm. Um, there was you know, a lot of people involved in the documentary that were, uh, like a lot, almost all of the key players were involved in the documentary. There's, um, a lot of stuff written about well, actually, not that much written about the history. There's uh, one great uh, book called Game Over, which came out in 1993. It goes into like pretty, pretty deep detail on the the business dealings and and how that all worked. Um, <clears throat> but I talked, I spoke to a handful of people, um, Atari employees, former Atari employees that worked there at the time. Um, a guy named Gilman Louie who was involved in the uh, <clears throat> business dealings of Tetris and um, a neuroscientist uh, who studied Tetris as well. Uh, and, uh, but unfortunately I never got to talk to Alexi, the creator of Tetris. Uh, I would have loved to talk to him. Um, 
it, it was it, uh, you said before in the intro it was it, it's very different than working when stuff that I'm used to working on whereas a lot of my books were are about like one character and the development of that one character central figure this this book had a uh, a lot of different characters um, so that was that was a challenge for sure like keeping all those people straight. Yeah. Now, um, you, you mentioned uh, the the originator, the guy who really thought up Tetris, Alexei. Mm-hmm. And how do you pronounce this last name? Pajanov? Pajanov. Pajanov. Um, yeah. So you did attempt to reach out to him? Yeah, yeah, him and Hank. Mm-hmm. But uh, unfortunately... Hank Rogers. Hank Rogers, yeah. yeah. No dice, though. Oh. Well, who, who all did you interview for this book? Um, like I said before... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, neuroscientist, um, okay. uh, a handful of people that worked at Atari, um, and, um, uh, and, a, uh, and Gilman Louie, who was pretty close, closely involved in the creation of the, of, uh, the game. Okay. Cause, cause I didn't know if you had gotten to talk with any of the people that you, you kind of showcase in the book. Uh, mm. and, and speaking of the personalities, one of the things that I appreciate about Tetris, the, you know, this book, the games people play, is the way that you introduce the main players uh, mm. in, the, in this history. And you do so by giving us, I, I don't know if you would call it a, like a, a chapter introduction, but it's something like that where we get yeah. a black page with a panel of whoever it is that you're introducing uh, for yeah, that section. Um, that was kind of like a, an outgrowth of when I first started working on uh, the book, I kind of created just for my own reference, like a big, like family tree of all the different people and the players involved in it and how they were connected to each other. And, um, and you know, once the book got into editorial, um, one of the, one of the, uh, things we discussed was how it's difficult to keep all the characters in order and, and remember who's who and who, who they represent and stuff like that. So that was, I, I kind of deconstructed the family tree and, uh, used that to make these chapter headings that kind of introduce the characters before we see what they're, why they're important. Mm-hmm. Now, in going through the the family tree, as you mentioned, and, and by the way, did you sketch this out uh, like a family tree? Did you have yeah, some kind notes? of like I mean, I didn't draw a tree, but it looked like a you know like your ancestry dot com thing where it's you know uh, I got the idea from um, there's something Hank Rogers said where he talked about um, if you look at the back of the cartridge of any Tetris game, it the copyright information is like. Uh, Andromeda soft copyright so and so Andromeda soft Andromeda software copyright so and so bulletproof soft software copyright Elorg copyright Nintendo Entertainment System, so it like leaves a little family tree on the back just from the copyright. So, um, but it was incredibly helpful helpful to, to to trace the lineage of Tetris from where it goes from you know thought in Alexi's head to product that we all know and love mm-hmm. now you, you're talking about starting off in alexi uh Pechnov's head and one of the things i very much appreciate about the book is you know the the first section is when we're introduced to alexi and his friend vladimir mm-hmm. and vladimir and alexi have this conversation about um computers specifically gaming and, and then mm-hmm. specifically Alexei's philosophy, his views of gaming. And mm-hmm. this is this is where the narrative goes wide. Mm-hmm. And, and and I find it telling because it's it's right about here. Actually, you introduce this conversation by going wide. You give us you start off not in not in uh, Moscow, but on Earth. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then and then we move into Moscow and then the computer center at the Academy, Moscow Academy of Science. And then the two guys having a conversation. So you start broad and then get specific. And in many ways, mm-hmm. that's the way that the book Tetris uh, begins, that you mm-hmm. go broad with this larger philosophy of gaming and what it means to human behavior and psychology. Mm-hmm. And then you get into the nitty-gritty, the specifics of everything that went on behind the game Tetris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, originally when I was working on it, 
um, I just I I didn't have that beginning part. It was just it's it started with the beginning of time, right? Mm-hmm. And it was then it would have been like sixty or seventy pages before you actually get introduced to the main characters. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so uh, I added that part in the beginning, um, and also to kind of flesh out um, Vlad and uh, Alexei's relationship. Um, which, you know, um, uh, Gilman Louie talked about their relationship as, you know, Vlad was kind of like his, his, uh, go-to guy, like his right hand man, his sidekick. Um, whereas, you know, uh, he, he worked on the game in the sense that they would discuss, you know, uh, he would kick ideas back and forth with him. Um, so yeah. And then later in the books, Vlad comes back in as kind of, uh, uh, maybe one of the consequences of when capitalism interjects itself into art. Yeah, and uh, his story doesn't end well. No, yeah, he has a tragic ending, which you know it's hard. You can't. It, it's hard to draw a distinction that that I draw a straight line from what happens. Uh, you know, his suicide and and murder. Um. <clears throat> it's hard to draw a straight line directly from like financial loss to, to that. Um, that's what newspapers at the time did. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure much more complicated than, than, than that. Um, but it, it's something I wanted to include because, uh, it was, it, it was almost un, unavoidable, right? You kind of can't, couldn't turn away from that. And, uh, you know, if you look at the stories of like lottery winners and things like that, uh, it doesn't always end well. And, and I just wanted to leave that in there just to be like, you know, capitalism is great. And we think of that as, as a big win and like the, the, the epitome of success, but it doesn't always, you know, uh, bring with it all the happiness that you wish that it would, or you think that it might. Now, you've mentioned a couple times so far the way that this book, the manuscript, changed in the process of creating this, right? So, mm-hmm. so for instance, you know, you said that you inserted those introduction pages um, mm-hmm. as a way to divide things up and to introduce many of the name, main characters. You inserted the introductory part uh, in the conversation between Alexei and Vladimir as a way of beginning uh, this book, which wasn't there before. I mean, mm-hmm. did did this project uh, change significantly over the course of uh, the project? Uh, there was, you know, uh, you know, I kind of write, write it out as like loose thumbnails at first. So, and just kind of like outlining the basic story, but also a lot of the ideas involved. And then, you know, it gets more solid, while I'm making it. So I'm always like kind of course correcting and making adjustments here and there. And then like, sometimes you get, you come across something and you get an idea of how this could be kind of foreshadowed or, 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 you know, relates back to something that should have happened maybe earlier in the story. So yeah, you're always kind of like going back and refining the story and trying to make it as my concern is always clarity. And I always wanted to make it be as clear as possible, uh, as best I can anyway. Mm. Now, you know, we've, um, we've discussed some of the, the people who are involved in the story of Tetris, uh, the people that you keep coming back to in your book. And there are a lot, but in, in, mm. in the course of writing Tetris and in doing the research, did any one of these historical figures stand out to you in a way that you felt that you became close to them in certain ways, kind of like them more than the other players? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I of course identified with Alexi, the main character, mm-hmm. um, but also the character I really loved in it, um, Gunpei Yokoi, who is an inventor kind of, and he started out um, in the um, – in like the stock room in a, in a non-creative role at Nintendo when they were a toy company. And, uh, he had invented like a tool in it, 
that he used it during his job to help reach to help reach stuff high up on shelves. The Ultra Hand. The Ultra Hand, and it became <laughs> the Ultra Hand. And uh, then he he invented all these great things that we that are iconic now, like the light zapper. That you know, um, the the Game Boy. He also invented the Virtual Boy. He invented the um, the uh, um, shit. What was the other thing that he invented? Uh, uh, just all kinds of these. He invented Gyromite, the robot, <laughs> the robot toy that came with Nintendo, which was there because they wanted Nintendo to be a, considered a toy and not a computer. So they had like this Gyromite character which was like a, a robot that you could use that would help you somehow play this game called Gyromite uh, that came with like the original Nintendo. He was always thinking very practically and, out, and, and outside of the, uh, you know, outside of, uh, of the computer world where everything is inside the computer. He was very much thinking of ways to uh, interact with it and, 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 use things practically, which is part of what I think part of Nintendo's philosophy still, I think today, if you think about the way they, they use the Wii and, um, there was like a uh, stuff with, even with old Nintendo that where you'd run on a pad and it would, you could play the game with that and, and all kinds of other things in that, in that vein. They have the Amiibos now, which are like toys that you can also connect to the game. Um, uh, all of that stuff comes from this guy Gunpei Yokoi. He invented the game and watch, which is which is the, the original mobile game. And and uh, with the with the game and watch, he invented the the plus sign um, controller that 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 is on like every game pad still to this day. It's on my Roku remote. Mm-hmm. You know, all that stuff uh, came from this guy. He actually died young too, tragically. Uh, but it was kind of unrelated to it, it, he got into like a car accident, I think, um, unfortunately. Um, but he was great. He was one of the he was awesome. I loved him. Loved loved writing and using him as a character. Yeah, Gunpai Yokoi. I mean, he he's one of the I guess the, one of the most fascinating characters in this story. In that there are a lot of um, I got nuggets of information that are are associated with him that I wouldn't have even thought of. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, the, the, the plus sign controller, you know, I, I, have you know, used it for years. I've seen it. I've never really thought about it. Like who, who came up with that idea? And it was, he, it was him. Um, yeah. and, and also wasn't he the one who got the idea of what originally became the game boy by, by seeing people on the train, uh, playing with their calculators. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the game and watch system yeah. where it was like, you know, and ca- you know, think about calculators and what they look like. The Game and Watch used that same system, that black crystal uh, system, to make the little characters, and it was like the same technology. And it was a watch too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so it was like the first, uh, like almost like the uh, like your iPhone, um, and it all be- all became all because he saw somebody just screwing around with a calculator to. to to pass the time on the train. Yeah, so he he's definitely a memorable character. Uh, and, and and for me, another memorable character maybe in a more negative or at least a, a not as happy uh manner is Robert Stein of Andromeda Software. Sure. Uh I mean he he strikes me as something almost akin to a schlamazel in this story. <laughs> <laughs> where things just keep happening to him and he you know he can't control things he just does what he can to get by yeah i mean like it's hard to say like if you know there's it's controversial like did he get kind of ousted by by the larger company or was he did he was this by almost his own design you know uh did you know he he kind of jumped the gun on on the rights to tetris which was you know, which was beneficial to him at first, you know, and then and then, you know, uh, he ended up losing the rights and losing in the court case. And the whole the whole the court case, t- too, is uh, uh, kind of amazing, too, like that, where it was an enormous court case involved in, in and Tetris got got sucked into this larger court case that was Atari versus Nintendo. 
And, uh, and that's through that court case is also how Atari was able to gain the, 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 the Nintendo chip plans. And that's how they were able to copy the Nintendo chip and release the illegal version of Tetris. And, and, and Stein's, uh, you know, Stein was involved in that. Atari was involved in that same lawsuit. Um, Belikov, the guy who negotiated the, all of these contracts ended up all getting involved in this larger lawsuit that was settled by, um, the, uh, um, Supreme Court of California. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, my, one of my favorite things about that whole story is that you have all these men, like almost all the characters are men, white men mostly, uh, involved in uh, these all these business dealings. And a woman, the judge, is the one who des- decides all of their fate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, you give uh, U.S. District Court Judge Fern Smith a prominent role toward the end yeah. of the book. And she she was the ultimate decider of this. Mm-hmm. And like they were, they didn't, you know, the the, the legalities. They were writing. This was like, you know, they didn't have. They were coming up with these laws as as they needed them, right? Like, you know, they had to decide. You know, is a Nintendo a computer or is it a toy, and does that matter? And and what are mobile game rights? The rights to the mobile version is that different than the computer rights? You know, um, these things were needed to be decided in the court of law, and that's that's what happened. Yeah, and, and then a couple of other characters really stand out. You've already mentioned uh, uh, Jenny Belikov, uh, the Russian, and he is. Um... With what Elgorg? Uh, uh, Elorg, yeah, uh, yeah, Elorg. Uh, which uh, what does that stand for? Electrono, it's, Electrono it's really, Technica. Really long, yeah, it's a really long uh, Russian word, but it's basically the uh, government agency that was in charge of computer business <laughs> in 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 a burgeoning capitalist, formerly or about to be about to be non-communist russia Mm -hmm. and and he and hank rogers strike me as somewhat similar because both of them are very effective in what they do but they don't set out to be effective they just kind of stumble into effectiveness well i think they it's deceiving i mean I, i mean i think that um uh hank is actually like an incredibly savvy guy and kind of sees a little bit a couple steps ahead and he does things kind of unorthodox in this in this book, uh, uh, winging it in a way where he flies to Russia without even really knowing anybody. Yeah. Um, and they both do, they both do that too. I think that makes them they're both really effective in that way and are really good at their job, uh, and and just smart and clever, because because you know Hank is just maneuvering. He's kind of improving his way, and he ends up being the victor. Um, and Belikov, uh, he had he had a, a fire under his uh, under him, like because if he screwed up this, you know, the consequences for screwing up your job in communist Russia at the time, especially one that would lose lose the government a lot of money, uh, were were pretty bad. Like so, <laughs> if, if if things didn't go his way with the court trial, he might have ended up in jail or you know something something bad. Uh, and Gorbachev knew about Tetris, the Tetris negotiations. It was on their, their radar, um, and and he he you know as a, somebody new to business negotiations, uh, you know he had he had unorthodox methods too, but he was clever and perceptive in knowing who, who what he needed to do to to be all right. Well, obviously, you know, a lot of work, a lot of research uh, went into this book. How did that differ from everything that you prepped for with Andre the Giant? Uh, They were kind of similar. Um, I think with Andre, maybe there was more. uh, A lot of the stuff from Andre came from videotaped interviews, whereas the Tetra stuff, some of it was like that. And and there was some there's a. a lot of great stuff, even on YouTube, that is uh, just great for for this kind of stuff that I do. Um, 
so those in that way it's, it was a little different um it, uh I think I have a more natural, uh, voracious appetite for pro wrestling stuff <laughs> um, than than you know '80s business stuff. Uh, so, um, so that in that way, it was a little bit different. Uh, I was a little more uh, purpose driven, whereas um, with the Andre Andre research, I was kind of just like didn't really care if I learned anything in certain times, and sometimes stumbled upon upon stuff just by watching, uh, watching stuff on my own accord, like without even thinking about the fact that I was doing research. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, they were a little bit different in the, in the, in that way, but generally I kind of had similar methods. Uh, the Tetra story is a, uh, maybe a little more linear. Uh, but you know, I, I think, um, pretty much the same, similar, similar stuff similar uh did similar things in the research process and we should mention that both of these books uh were published through first second yep so now at first second are you becoming known as a creator whose work is what historical and biographical yeah they like nonfiction from me yeah i mean i think um they kind of um they're really great to work with i really really like everybody there. And I think they're really have a really good, um, vision for what they want. And, and they're very also open to, uh, anything that they think is good. And, and I don't feel boxed in without using, without being, uh, <laughs> using a pun, but I really don't. I feel like they're, they're, they're open to a lot of ideas you know, they're definitely more open to nonfiction at this point because it has, you know, a, a market foothold um, for me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if I had a really passionate fiction project, that would that I think they might buy into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I also like I, I like uh, w with my fiction, I think I would have to uh, make make mini comics until I got something substantial together before I could show it to them. Whereas with nonfiction, I can kind of sell them with the idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're really supportive of me. I just spent the entire weekend with the, the, the crew at, uh, at first second. And, um, I think, you know, um, at New York comic con. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think they're really great and they're growing and I'm really happy to be, be with, uh, working with them. Yeah. Um, by the way, was uh, Andy Hirsch there at New York as well? Um, possibly. Because I, I, I thought he – I saw that he was because he is a first, second author now. His book Varmints came out a couple of weeks ago. Okay. I haven't met – I'm not sure if I met him yet. Okay. Yeah, he's uh, he's a friend of ours. Uh, he, in fact, he lives not too far from where I am in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But he's a great guy. I didn't know if you'd gotten to meet him there. Uh, unfortunately not. Mm. So okay, now you know you're you're doing this work with first second. You mentioned that they like the the nonfiction stuff, which makes sense. You know they have that new initiative with the with the science books, right? Uh, yeah. Or that new series, mm -hmm. and in your more I guess fictional experimental stuff, you seem to keep with your own uh, press uh, mm -hmm. retrofit. Uh, yeah, and, and then you and, and Jared have retrofed Big Planet, and is mm -hmm. that is that something that you like set out to to differentiate that you have one kind of writing that you do for retrofit, and then another that you could publish for other people like for a second? Um, no, I mean I think I would I would be open to publishing fiction work with other companies, um, but I think a lot of times when I get like a thrill out of the way that I can do it with retrofit. Whereas I can finish something and send it to the printer and have it be out in like a couple weeks. Whereas, um, with, with other, with, with larger companies or with a lot of other companies you just go into the pipeline and that's just kind of how it is. And that's, it is, that's how it is with other people in retrofit. It's just, you know, you have to, you have a schedule and you, you can't, you know, just, Although I try to be kind of on, uh, off the cuff there, you have to market the stuff, but and all that. But 
um, I'm okay with just throwing the stuff out there, and it's kind of a I kind of see it as like a thrill thing, and and um, I, I get I get excited about it, and I like having full creative control um, and being able to design the whole book myself, which I'm sure other companies would l- allow me to do that, but not with this level of freedom where I get to make all the executive decisions and all that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of scratches a different itch and, and, uh, you know, it's, I, I get a thrill out of not working kind of with an editor on those things. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. And I, 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 I haven't really done fiction too much in the last year because I've been working on a, another nonfiction book. Um, but I am, and I'm going on this tour for Tetris, uh, but I'm excited when I get back to work on all different stuff uh, in between maybe another big project. Mm-hmm. You know, now getting back to your earlier book, Andre the Giant, uh, uh, did you, and I'm sure you did, uh, being a wrestling fan especially, uh, read the other Andre the Giant graphic novel by Brandon Easton and Dennis uh, Madry? Uh, you know, I haven't really uh, read the whole thing. I've I've seen it and uh, flipped through it and stuff, and it's a lot different than mine, I guess. I think for a while I was like, didn't want to read it, um, but I would totally read it now. I just haven't. And one of the reasons why I asked, because I haven't read it, uh, I remember when it first came out, or right before it came out, and I saw the solicits, and I thought, okay, well... You know, box beat those guys to the punch, and uh-huh. I was wondering how different that book was from from yours. So, how how is it different, at least from what you've read? Um, the art it's in uh, kind of full color. Um, I have a def- definitely a different um, art style. Uh, I have a very unconventional kind of art style, I guess. Um, uh. But, you know, uh, it's also an official mer- piece of merchandise, and ours is not. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that, too. Um, but, you know, I, I just think it's different perspective on the same story. And um, I wish them well with it, for sure. What kind of response did you get from your own book, Andre the Giant, from the wrestling community? Oh, man, I love the wrestling community so much, like... It's weird. I think the 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 wrestling community and the comics community and the comics community is like can be like this too. But but I don't know. I, I think it's wrestling people like have this nostalgia for their characters and love for their characters and love for wrestling stuff. Um, and and to see wrestling in a different medium is uh, exciting. I understand it because as a fan, you know. Because, uh, you know, you spend so much time as a pro wrestling fan kind of lingering in the shadows, right? Um, because, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you can't just come out as a pro wrestling fan in every situation. I do now. But when I was, like, say, in high school, I was, like, embarrassed by my, my wrestling fandom and, and um, very excited any time I saw pro wrestling outside of its, its uh, you know, own space, Let's say now it's kind of so mainstream and you see it all over the place that, um, you know, it, it's it's uh, different, I think, now than maybe it was back then. But I would always get excited. like when my Macho Man was on in Slim Jim commercials. That was that was exciting to me because it was wrestling outside of pro wrestling. So uh, I think the, the pro wrestling fans have been really supportive and, and really uh, enjoyed the book, I think. Um <clears throat> I've gotten to, you know, since I've gotten involved in, in the wrestling community, I've gotten to do lots of different art for stuff um, that maybe I wouldn't have before, like pro wrestling t-shirts and, and um, uh, different poster art for, for pro wrestling. And uh, it's really been a great way for me to kind of like show my appreciation for that as a, as a fan, you know? Mm-hmm. Now we were talking about your work with Retrofit. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you and Jared do you know Retrofit Big Planet, and I'm wondering how your work as a publisher complements your work as a creator, your own comics for, let's say, Retrofit, or what you've been doing for First Second. Yeah, it definitely is uh, works hand in hand. Like, I really love being an editor and um, and having being having it scratches some other creative creative itch that I have, you know, uh, being like, a, it's kind of like being a little curator and, and a little bit of a book designer 
and a little bit of the social butterfly because I get to work with all these different artists and uh, and and uh, get to get to figure learn about other people's processes and I like to uh, take I like to um, present works that I that I really like in in what I see as like a, 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 pot, a really good light you know and make them shine as best I can uh, and, and definitely just talk just talking and, and and working with the other artists definitely it, it informs the way that I work a uh, way that I make comics for sure always in in, in, in myriad ways. Now, you guys are, over the past several years, have been really prolific with the retrofit Big Planet stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we are, we, I, that's been part of our thing from the beginning. I think that's part of my, just the way I am. I'm kind of like obsessive compulsive in a clinical way about, um, and about comics and, and, and keeping busy. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, I think that stems from that. Um it's not always necessarily the best idea because you run out of money. You know, you like, you know, have cash flow issues at times. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's just how I like to do it. Now, for those who haven't heard our retrofit big planet spotlight from a while back, well, first off, you know, shame on them. Uh, they mm-hmm. need to go back and listen to that. Uh, but, but tell our listeners now who haven't heard that show, how you and Jared got together. Um, it was actually, uh, pretty interesting. Like I, I, um, uh, I, I was in having a rough go of it, doing it all myself. Um, uh, I had published, put out like maybe 18 comics that were kind of all like mini, mini comics and nothing with a spine or anything like that. Mostly black and white stuff. And uh, I, 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 at the time when I first started, I was like, oh, I'm learning, I can learn how to run a business really easy, but I learned that I'm not as, uh, apt. That's not my best skill as running, running a business, let's say. And, um, I had been thinking about what to do, maybe folding, probably folding. Uh, I had, uh, printer bills that needed to be paid or at least taking a really long break from it. Um, at, the, at around the same time, uh, Jared contacted me and, and big planet had been for a long time, a uh, big supporter of, of retrofit comics. And he, he wanted to, the, the big planet stores, big planet stores. Right, yeah. yeah. They wanted to, he, Jared wanted to get into publishing himself. And so he emailed me to kind of see, uh, you know, what, how, some tips or tricks or maybe like how, how to do it or, or what the business is like. And I kind of saw it as an opportunity to say, Hey, maybe he might want to get involved in retrofit because I'm having a hard time here. And, um, and he got, he was into the idea. And since then, uh, it's been great for me because I have Jared who runs big planet and is involved in the business end of all as a retailer all of these things and um he he kind of handles all that stuff and he's really like there there's he does more for retrofit than i think he gets credit for a lot uh because we wouldn't really be here with it, it, without him and his his staff really uh and his know-how and and ability and all that stuff mm. and um it allows me to just be have like a creative role and kind of be just like the brand ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that uh, on the Comics Alternative, we absolutely love you guys because, I mean, you know, you send us the stuff and let us know that the material is out there, which we really appreciate. Uh, but that's really important because it provides us with a number of things to talk about on the show. And we talk a lot about Retrofit Big Planet. In fact, a few weeks ago, we discussed Eleanor Davis's Libby's Dad. Oh, it's so great. Yeah. I feel uh, I felt really privileged to to work with her. I, I I hold her in very high esteem and um I just love her comics. I have for a long time. I remember when I was first getting into comics that was like her you know, her stuff was some of the first stuff that I really saw as like a just really, really standout work. Um I remember they you know, she used to make uh these really really well-made handmade mini comics they would be like silk screened and 
and you know special cutaway covers and all this stuff and uh so it was always very inspiring for me and then seeing her progress since then has been really great so i felt felt really happy to 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 just to to work with her and and see how she works and which is, was very fast and, and professional and and uh you know just you know getting to see these pages and how she thought about layout and things like that it's it's a learning experience of course for me too well you know that's part of what you guys do at retrofed big planet right i mean not only do you publish really young new creators but also um you provide an opportunity for already established creators who have published with larger presses to do, let's say, maybe smaller projects that some people may call mini comics, something much more like pamphlet format. Um, mm-hmm. and it, it's an alternative to what they would do with the larger presses. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I just have a special place in my heart for these shorter works. And I think kind of sometimes short stories are harder to sell in, in comparison to the graphic novel. And and it's the same way it is in literature, where short stories, uh, you know, the novel traditionally will sell better than a than a short story. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think in comics, uh, the com- the short comic story uh, is uh, important, and it's how we take in comics all the time. And and um, uh, and I I just love those those little books, you know. Well, speaking of shorter stories, when are we going to get another issue of Number? Uh, oh, maybe soon. Um, I have some time off uh, for the next month or two uh, in between projects, so I'll be doing all kinds of weird things. Any any kind of thing I can uh, I can do in, be- in between these these uh, larger projects. You know, sometimes uh, I was on this panel this weekend um, uh, talking with a woman named Penelope. Bagu, Bagu, I, I can't pronounce her. I, I'm not sure. I'm sure I'm butchering her last name. Uh, she's a French cartoonist, and uh, she talked about. I totally related to this. Um, she talked about when you make a graphic novel, you get really, really excited about it in the beginning, and and um, and when you're creating or writing it, and and first getting the characters down, and you're really excited about the project, and then you have to do all this work, and it, and. She described the middle of the book. It's like you're crawling through the desert, <laughs> and it is like that. You know, like the hardest page to draw is like the page right after you drew the middle of the book, where you go, oh, "I just drew 125 pages. Now I have to do it all over again." Uh, it it it, uh, it it's it's arduous. It's an arduous process. Whereas when you're doing uh, shorter works or uh, uh, little comics like that, experimental projects, you can maintain the excitement all the way through the project. So it kind of – it definitely scratches like a different itch. Yeah, and we should mention to our listeners who may not be aware that Number, or I guess you may pronounce it Number, mm-hmm. is um, – uh, like a comic book series where you – I guess a single author anthology, would you call it mm-hmm. that? Yes. Yeah, uh, and there are – what are there, two issues out so far? Yeah, there's two issues. It's kind of like uh, the, my book, An Entity Observes All Things, was going to be issue three. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of uh, morphed into something much larger, uh, all involving um, um, sci-fi jaunts. And uh, a lot of these mini comic, these sci-fi stories I had as mini comics were out of print, and I had – uh, kind of too big of an issue of number to do. Uh, it was kind of longer than it than one of those issues could be. So it, it ended up becoming an entity observes all things. The the short short story collection. Mm. And an entity observes all things was nominated last year for an Ignance in the outstanding anthology or collection category. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then that was the um, every every year since Retrof has been in existence, we've been nominated for. Uh, an Ignatz Award, and um, that year I was the I was the one <laughs> the retrofit comic that was nominated for the Ignatz Award, and that was the first one I lost, <laughs> and the first one retrofit lost. Uh, but Eleanor Davis won, so in a way we won. <laughs> yeah, you know I was about to say, look who you were up against uh, in that category. There was Eleanor Davis's How to Be Happy. You also had Jillian uh, Tamaki's. 
Super Mutant Magic Academy, and, and it's something that I thought was going to win this category, is the Drawn and Quarterly 25-Year Anthology. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I mean, listen, you could go, it's hard to, it's hard to critique the Ignatz Awards, but um, I think the, uh, the anthology collection category is kind of two different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's the anthology that is multiple cartoonists that is a totally different reading experience than a collection of daily strips or a collection of short stories. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's hard to be a, to 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 um, do that perfectly. And it's kind of frivolous anyway, uh, awards. Um because, you know, uh, it feels really nice to be recognized and things like that. They're imperfect, always. Yeah. Now, you mentioned a little while ago that you're currently working on another project. Is there anything that you can tell us about that? Uh, yeah, it hasn't been announced yet. Um, so I can't really say too much about it. Um, but it'll be out from first second. Um, oh, another first sure. second, huh? Yeah, I'm not sure when. <laughs> okay. Um, and then before we go, I, I have to get back to Tetris, so we're ending as we began. Now, the, sure. sub, the subtitle for Tetris is The Games People Play. And it, to me, that subtitle suggests that you're looking at more than just the history and the phenomena of Tetris, which mm-hmm. is what the book does, I think. It looks at Tetris, but it also looks at the larger world of gaming and why people play games. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have that idea for a subtitle and that approach from the beginning? Uh, no, it kind of came later, um, but I I really liked it because um, not only does it mention give give the reader a little inkling that there's going to be more to this than just the Tetris story, you know the idiom. I thought it was a very clever title because there's an idiom, you know, the games people play uh, that refers to kind of these underhanded or uh, moves people make to get ahead. Uh, and that kind of relates also to the Tetris business story. Um, also it references a really great song, uh, that I love, um, that's on a Dwayne Allman album. (laughs) I I was wondering if you were going to mention, what is it? The Alan Parsons project. Yeah. Oh no. (laughs) It might be the same song though. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Tetris, the games people play. It, it, it's a great book, and uh, it, it's something that Box I have recommended to my students because I teach at UT Dallas in the Arts and Technology program, and the vast majority of my students in my courses are there for game studies or game design in some form or another. And I told them that this is right up their alley. It'll come out soon, and I'm sure that they'll just eat this up. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank you again for being on the Comics Alternative, and good luck with the publicity and the tour for the new book. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. And there you have it, my conversation with Box Brown. I want to thank him again for taking the time and being on the Comics Alternative. And if you want to see Box on his tour, then head on over to his website, which is boxbrown.com. And you'll find that over the coming days, he's going to be all over the country in places such as Boston, Massachusetts, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, my home state, Decatur, Georgia, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Mount. Mountain View, California, Berkeley, and Madison, Wisconsin. So make sure that you catch him on this book tour. And, you know, make sure that you get his new book, Tetris, The Games People Play, which unfortunately you cannot find at the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. But if you go to comicsalternative.com slash Amazon and you click on our Amazon Associates link, Head on over to Amazon and search for Tetris, and you can get the book at a great Amazon discount. Plus, you'll be helping out the comics alternative. But you know you can find his earlier book, Andre the Giant, Life and Legend, at Discount Comic Book Service at 30% off. So whether you get your Box Brown fix at DCBService.com or through Amazon, you can't go wrong. And you'll be helping out the show by doing so. 
And after you do get your books at those places, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about my conversation with Box Brown. If you go to the website comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or if you want to call us the old-fashioned way, then pick up the phone and dial 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email the show. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media, such as on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, via Google Play Music. But you know, you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. We've got more interviews in the days to come, so listen up for those. Until then, take care.